will be recording yeah great that starts uh, good morning everybody uh, i think there are some 30 odd and uh, this number would swell up uh, the number of pgs attending because it's primarily meant for them and it is one of the ihrs activity which is uh, done in these times uh, only yesterday evening uh, our ihrs president dr yash lokhandwala was Ending the EC for starting multiple academic programs through the last two years. Uh, and uh, this is something that is unique with the IHRS. Not many of them may be doing this. Of course, uh, that's, we, we, pride on, we, we are proud of it. Now, this is the sixth session of a teaching program, which is purely meant for the cardiology postgraduates. So it is uh, tailored every time such that uh, it benefits their curriculum and uh, makes them all-round cardiologists. This time we are thankful to Professor Dr. Jayaprakash Shenthar from uh, Jayadeva Institute of uh, Cardiovascular Sciences in Bangalore for being kind uh, to construct a program uh, for us and uh, the faculty from his department and the fellows from his department would partake. I would request each one of them to introduce themselves as they start. Uh, we have... Uh, now, both his topics are not actually nightmares, but an injurious syncope can be a diagnostic problem and CID infection is obviously a nightmare. And I'm told that they will simplify it amply for the postgraduate to learn through these times. Uh, the moderators who have graciously agreed to today's session are uh, Dr. Anil Saxena from New Delhi. He is the ex-president of the IHRS and uh, very, very nice academician who makes things very simple for us. I think this topic is close to his heart. Dr. Anup Gupta is a senior electrophysiologist and uh, also an interventional cardiologist from Ahmedabad. And uh, most of the PGs would be able to strike chord with him because of the simplicity with which he uh, makes his remarks. So I'm not going to waste much time in introducing any further. There is a chat box, as you all know. You can put in your questions therein as floridly as you want. And uh, <clears throat> anybody from the IHRS faculty who is attending or who are the faculty for today's program can keep on answering those questions. Sometimes for the sake of time, you're not able to take every question during the meet. Uh, so uh, the text uh, chat can obviously continue as fervently as it needs to be. Uh, one of the topic, I think in the first session, I can request Dr. Saxena to uh, keep... Uh, uh, not necessarily keeping all the questions at the end, but he can also discuss it uh, through the program and as required, uh, keep on discussing with the speaker by uh, as required interrupting. For the others, I would request them that you please uh, mute yourself because sometimes this background noise creates a lot of disturbance for the other audience. So I think uh, maybe a line from Dr. Shantar to introduce this and uh, then we go on with the first presentation. JP, yours. You are muted, Dr. J.P. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you, Anup and Anil for having given us an opportunity for presenting um, these topics, which I think are not covered in a routine um, IH, uh, IHRS DNB programs. Usually it's arrhythmias, but one has to realize that syncope is quite a common problem, which often is neglected and um, it results not only in some morbidity, but also in quite severe, um, you know, occasionally in mortality also. Um, so a proper approach is quite important. We have, uh, you know, my colleague, Dr. Satish, who is my associate professor in, in our department. We have a fairly dynamic department. Uh, Dr. Satish is my associate professor. And we have Deepak and Bharat, who are the other two uh, assistant professors, along with Darshan, who has joined us recently. Uh, and um, my fellows who are going to be present, uh, presenting today would be Dr. Abhinav, um, who is probably from Ashish area. Uh, so he's training and probably he'll come back to you. And then oh. Dr. Chetan, who is going to be there, who's, who's again my fellow, uh, who will be presenting, these two people will be presenting on to syncope topics. Um, this will be preceded by Dr. Satish talking on the approach to syncope. 
Now, following that will be Dr. Sam, who is going to present a um, case of um, uh, you know, device infection, of how we approach it. And finally, I will be talking on uh, uh, CID infections pre and post, because this is becoming quite a, a sort of a problem now with more and more implanters uh, implanting devices. And finally, we'll sort of probably wind it up with some comments from everybody. And I'll probably give you some take home messages at the end, hopefully with whatever little knowledge I have. So I'll leave it to Anup and uh, Anil to take it forward. And we hope to have a good session today. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. JP. So the topic is very interesting and something which is very, uh, as uh, you described, very uh, common problem and uh, filled with mystery because the problem with the syncope is that when the patient present, the event has already passed and uh, we have to look for the smoking gun. And uh, that's why it becomes sometimes very difficult. And also it is quite diverse in the sense that some people have a very benign prognosis while others may be sitting on a strong possibility of sudden death. So uh, to describe, to discuss the uh, problem of syncope, we have uh, Dr. Satish Reddy, who Dr. JP has already uh, mentioned. He's associate professor in Sri Jayadeva Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences, Bengaluru. He will tell us about uh, uh, the current approach to syncope, and then we'll have some case-based case discussion. Dr. Reddy, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Jay Prakash, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, good morning, uh, respected chairs, my dear colleagues, and my dear friends. Today, I'll be uh, speaking regarding approach to patient with uh, syncope. We all know syncope is a symptom. It can be a manifestation of a simple vasovagal syncope, or it can be a manifestation of underlying cardiac issue, which, if not recognized, can lead to cardiac arrest and cardiac death. You know, we encounter patients of a syncope in OPD setting as well as in emergency care setting. At least 30 to 40 percent of the population will have syncope once in their lifetime, and in these 50 percent may have recurrence once again. So, syncope is uh, defined as abrupt, transient, complete loss of consciousness associated with inability to maintain postural tone. There is a rapid and spontaneous recovery. There is no need for any electrical or chemical therapy. So it's defined as transient abrupt loss of consciousness with inability to maintain the postural tone with spontaneous recovery. It doesn't require any form of intervention for recovery. The presumed mechanism is cerebral hypoperfusion. Sometimes pre -syn uh, syncope may be preceded by some pre monitoring symptoms like uh, greediness, uh, nausea, vomiting, tunnel vision. This we call uh, with the altered sensorium, this without lo losing consciousness, this we call it as pre syncope. If the pre syncopal episode lasts for some time, patient may uh, do some uh, counter pressure maneuvers and uh, synco full blown syncope may be aborted. So, coming to differential diagnosis of uh, uh, syncope, the, uh, those conditions where there is transient loss of consciousness, like uh, seizure disorder and uh, psychogenic syncope. What, what are the things which help in differentiating these, these uh, three conditions? One is the situation in which it is occurring and uh, the events what happened during the episode and uh, what happens after the recovery of the episode. Co mainly coming to syncope, most of the times it happens in uh, predetermined situations like a patient in the erect posture, when they are in uh, sunlight after uh, uh, tired, having a history of fever or exposed to some uh, too much of uh, stress and uh, uh, painful stimuli, which is unexpected. Uh, this is the situation where uh, syncopal episode happen. And before syncope, losing consciousness, they may have symptoms of prodromo like nausea, vomiting, uh, giddiness, light headedness. And during the episode, they fall immediately and uh, uh, they regain the consciousness immediately. After regaining the consciousness, they are fully oriented to time and place immediately. If uh, any bystander is there, you should always take history from bystander. Uh, it's very important. In syncope, there won't be any injury because they will have pre monitoring symptoms. They will always go in for protective posture and there won't be any bowel or bladder incontinence or there won't be any uh, convulsive movements won't be there. May, if at all, there may be brief convulsive movements, but uh, it won't be like uh, generalized tonic clonic movements lasting for a few minutes. And uh, the bystander will give a history of uh, losing consciousness uh, transiently. In fact, the patient may be pale 
and uh, pulse and VPA may be on the lower side. Coming to seizure disorder, seizure disorder, there, uh, there, before the episode, they may have aura like uh, visual or auditory aura. And uh, because uh, there is no pre symptoms, symptoms, there may be fall, the patient may injury, they will have a tonic clonic movements, there may be bowel and bladder incontinence, and uh, uh, uprolling of eyeballs or deviation of eyeballs can be there. Patient may regain their consciousness after a few minutes, but uh, you, uh, they, may, they are not oriented to time and uh, place. And they will have severe tiredness and uh, fatigue and muscle pain can be there. And if there's a bystander who has witnessed the event, they give the history of uh, uh, this involuntary movement stroking, and they may give a history of a patient turning bluish during the episode. Most of the times, psych third one is psychogenic syncope. Psychogenic syncope always happen in front of the bystander, in front of attenders, this happens. This happens in young female patients where the patient uh, loses or uh, close their eyeball and uh, behave as if they have lost the consciousness. If you check pulse and BP, it will be normal. There will be no injury, no bowel, bad incontinence. And uh, it may last for some uh, time. After regaining the consciousness, they will be totally oriented to time and place. This is how you differentiate between syncope, seizure disorder, and psychogenic syncope. And uh, co coming to the classification of syncope, uh, we, uh, this is uh, from uh, ESC guidelines 2018. It's classified into three types reflex syncope, syncope due to orthostatic hypotension. Excuse me, uh, uh, Preeti, can you put everybody on mute and let only Satish be speaking? So, out of the uh, syncope, reflex syncope is the commonest form of syncope, and uh, uh, commonest is vasovagal syncope. Normally, this happens in young patients when they are uh, fatigued, tired in the sunlight, in the red posture, like a child standing in the prayer. Uh, they have pre monetary symptoms like nausea vomiting, they fall, and immediately they regain the uh, consciousness. This is what the history will be there. Keratid sinus syncope happen mainly in elderly group of patients. Uh, like uh, they may give uh, history like while uh, shaving, uh, they losing consciousness or while uh, tying the tie or uh, uh, reaching something for in the attic or garlanding statue when they extend the neck. Uh, because of keratid sinus syncope, they may lose uh, uh, the syncope out. Uh, situational syncope, as the term explains, uh, it uh, happens during a uh, micturation or uh, uh, cough syncope or the situation, situation syncope. Sometimes uh, with history also we are not able to come to conclusion, like there will be non-classical presentation. And the <laughs> next common thing is syncope due to orthostatic hypertension. This happens predominantly in elderly group of patients who are on multiple anti-hypertensive drugs or uh, patients with uh, neurological disease with either maybe primary autonomic dysfunction or patients with uh, Parkinson's disease where they give a clear history of uh, standing for a long time and the fall. The third thing is a cardiac, cardiogenic syncope, which are uh, most of the times, if not recognized, can be lead to uh, cardiac events, pathological things. It either arrhythmic causes like bradyarrhythmias or tachyarrhythmias or obstructive etiologies. Obstructive etiologies like IOT stenosis or HOCM or pulmonary thromboembolism can cause syncope. This is what is classification of uh, syncope. Coming to pathophysiology. Pathophysiology, as I told you, it's all uh, cerebral hypoperfusion causes syncope. Cerebral hypoperfusion can be either due to low output, low, uh, low out, heart rate, or it can be reduced minus uh, reduced peripheral resistance. Reduced peripheral resistance predominantly happen in, uh, as I told you, syncope secondary to orthostatic hypotension. Most of the time, cardiogenic syncope, it's a low output state, whereas in reflex syncope, it's a combination of low output as well as reduced peripheral resistance. Coming to the etiology of the syncope, the commonest is uh, a neurally mediated syncope, reflex syncope. Uh, next will be orthostatic, and third will be uh, cardiac causes of syncope. In spite of thorough evaluation, nearly 30% of the percent of the cases we may not come to cause of uh, uh, it, uh, syncope initial, at initial evaluation, which may require further investigation. Coming to prognosis, uh, the prognosis in uh, orthostatic hypotension uh, or vasovagal syncope is as as a normal population. There will be no mortality. As you know, in cardiac syncope, if not recognized, they will have a mortality. So what are the diagnostic tests what we can use in uh, syncope? Uh, main thing is history, both from the patient as well as from the bystander and uh, checking for blood pressure, keratin sinus massage, and uh, ECG with both short and long-term monitoring, echocardiogram, field test, and electrophysiological test. These are the tests which we use in evaluation of patient with syncope. History is the history and physical examination is the most important thing in evaluating the patient with uh, syncope. 
what are the clinical features which suggest uh, a specific cause of syncope? We think of reflex syncope uh, in the absence of any patient with having history of uh, uh, syncope where there is an absence of cardiac disease and they have syncope for many years without uh, uh, and the syncope happening in a sudden, unexpected, and un un unpleasant sensation. Patient standing in hot sunlight in crowded uh, situation. Patient with uh, fever waiting in the hospital for a long time, or when they when they when, when there's having syncope out during the time of uh, blood drawing. These are the situations where we think of re reflex syncope. Uh, one is keratinic sinus syncope, which you should not miss out in elderly, as I mentioned earlier. And the reflex syncope is also happens post exertion. Second is syncope due to orthostatic hypertension happening in elderly group of population where they will be standing in for a long time. There will be in multiple antihypertensive drugs and uh, they may be having underlying autonomic dysfunction or they may be having Parkinson's disease. And uh, third one is cardiac syncope. Cardiac syncope may not have any pro previous uh, two, both in uh, uh, vesovagal syncope as well as syncope due to orthostatic hypertension, there may be prodromal symptoms. Ca cardiac syncope. Uh, may not have prodromal symptoms. If they have prodromal symptoms, prodromal symptoms will be lasting for a very short duration. Um, like a palpation, immediately they may lose consciousness, they injure themselves. And the card, uh, previously, as I told, reflex syncope or orthostatic, they happen most of the time, patient will be in erect posture, whereas the cardiac syncope can happen even in supine posture. And you should think of cardiac syncope when especially uh, syncope happening during the time of exertion. So what are the physical examination findings, what we uh, look at? If you encounter the patient in emergency setting, if the patient is pale, we think, we think in terms of reflex syncope. If pale, you should also look for any bleeding is there, which is causing orthostatic hypertension. Presence of tachycardia, you should think in terms of ACS, pulmonary thrombosis, AC, uh, acute coronary syndrome. Presence of bradycardia, you should evaluate in terms of bradyarrhythmic causing uh, syncope. Main thing is looking for blood pressure and looking for postural drop. Normally. Or we should look for orthostatic hypotension. Uh, normally, if a patient, if a person stands, normally there won't be significant drop in BP because of uh, a sympathetic drive and uh, vasoconstriction. For example, if there is a drop of more than 10, 20 mm or uh, for systolic or more than 10 millimeter of diastolic and upright posture, this suggests orthostatic hypotension. If it happens immediately after standing, we call it as uh, immediate orthostatic hypotension. That is within one minute. We call it as immediate orthostatic hypotension. The classical form of orthostatic hypotension is where it happens over a period of few minutes, like within three minutes, they develop this orthostatic hypotension. Delayed orthostatic hypotension is where orthostatic hypertension happens after more than five minutes. This we pick up while doing uh, tilt table test. Other uh, thing, the physical thing you can do uh, in the OPD setting or you can do while doing a tilt table test is carotid sinus massage, where uh, we do uh, a carotid sinus massage. It's not, it's not like, uh, to terminate the tachycardia, here the pressure should be gentle, of, uh, done over internal carotid artery just above bifurcation for 5 to 10 seconds. Uh, uh, so it should be done in supine. If it is not elicited in supine posture, it should also be done in the upright posture. Uh, outcome will be if there is an asystole of more than 3 seconds or more than 50 mm blood pressure drop, we call it as a, uh, and with reproduction of symptoms, we say it is a carotid sinus syndrome, carotid sinus syncope. What the absolute contraindication is presence of a keratin buoy. Our patient had a CVA recently, or on a Doppler, if there is any obstruction of keratin artery, we should not be doing. In, the complications of the procedure is very less, maybe less than 0.2%. That CVA is one of the complications of keratin sinus massage. Next, what we see immediately is electrocardiogram. Uh, ECG may give us a clue towards uh, uh, which is uh, life threatening conditions, like the patient may be having a LQT causing syncope or you may be having a Brugada pattern like even with, with the ST elevation, Brugada pattern. You may be having tachycardia with right ventricular strains suggest in terms of pulmonary thromboembolism or ST elevation suggested coronary, acute coronary uh, uh, event causing a syncope. And uh, uh, we should look for any delta waves suggest uh, uh, WPT causing syncope or look for bradycardia uh, so that uh, uh, it suggests six sinus syndrome causing a syncope. And the uh, role of echocardiogram is to rule out the structural artists like uh, Stenotic lesions like iotic stenosis or presence of uh, HOCM or rule out pulmonary thromboembolism. Exercise testing can be done if the syncope happens during exercise. Uh, mainly, it happens in uh, uh, if, uh, if already you should have ruled out structural artists like iotic stenosis or HOCM, 
if for structurally normal out, if for there is excess induced syncope, we can do TMP to look for uh, any arrhythmias during syncope, like uh, uh, in, in CPVT or LQT, where arrhythmias can be induced during syncopal episode. The role uh, next will be uh, the utilization of a tilt test. Normally, if uh, history is classical, like a patient tells his young patient uh, with classical prodromal symptoms, fall, recover, then if the history is classical, then there is no need for asking for tilt table test. Tilt table test should be used when diagnosis is unclear. We are not sure of the diagnosis of the initial evolution and we still suspect a vesovical syncope, then we can go for tilt table test. Or when we suspect a syncope due to orthostatic hypotension, we can use tilt test. Other conditions where we can use tilt test is uh, in case of uh, uh, convulsive syncope, where a patient may have syncope, but they may have brief tonic clonic movements, which is possible in syncope to rule out convulsive syncope, we can use a tilt table test. And also in the diagnosis of uh, uh, pseudo syncope, uh, while doing a, a pseudo syncope, we can uh, combine with EEG as well as uh, videographic recording for evaluation. And uh, in elderly patient, they may give history of falls without loss of consciousness, but there may be a lot of uh, loss of consciousness. There may be amnesia for this uh, LOC. So in this sort of population, to distinguish a syncope from falls, we can make use of tilt table test. What is important in tilt table test is to look for cardio inhibitory response. If there is a cardio inhibitory response with the uh, asystole, uh, that is, which precedes hypotension, then it's a type 2B response in this sort of population there may be a need, uh, need for pacing. So uh, with the rate of response of CLS, we may prevent further episodes of syncope. It's very important to document the uh, asystole uh, ready happening before hypotension. Because uh, uh, hypotension may happen initially, then uh, second, later they may have asystole and syncope. In these cases, the first event is hypotension. So second is asystole. Uh, even if you implant a pacing, it may not be beneficial because the first event which is triggering syncope is hypotension. If asystole is the first event, then a syncope, then pacing is indicated. One thing, uh, if you suspect a vesovagal, a, neg a negative tilt test does not exclude the diagnosis of uh, reflex syncope. And uh, if there, uh, if you don't know the cause of loss of consciousness, you do syncope, uh, there may be a hypotensive response. But uh, the concept of it only suggests there is hyposensitive susceptibility. It does not. Uh, come to conclusion for what is causing the uh, synco. Next is uh, what we use in uh, synco population ECG. I, I, I already told you, and long-term monitoring like uh, event recorders, external loop recorders, patch recorders, and uh, mobile outpatient telemetry and implantable loop, loop recorders. If the syncope is happening uh, very often, we can use uh, uh, Walter recordings or uh, uh, external loop recorders. If it happens uh, very uh, infrequently, like uh, once a year or twice a year, we can go for internal loop recorders. And uh, what is important uh, in these conditions is if uh, the patient sick up out during a uh, older or ELR, if uh, there is no rhythm disturbances, at least it smooths out, tachyar ready cause area is not causing the syncope. Or during the recording, there may be a systole suggesting that is having a UV block causing syncope. So it becomes an indication for uh, pacing. Especially IR plus should be used where uh, we are not able to conclusion after initial evaluation for long-term monitoring. Coming to the role of uh, electrophysiological studies, uh, electrophysiological studies, you suspect a patient coming with syncope, there is sinus bradycardia, you suspect a sinus node dysfunction, we do EP studies, we do a sinus node recovery time and evaluate sinus node function. If a patient with syncope, uh, we don't come to conclusion and initial evaluation, if there is a bundle branch block or trifascular block, we do EP study and uh, look for HV interval and look for any infraisent disease. So that need, there will be need for a pacemaker. If uh, a patient with syncope with the injuries or uh, if he has a brief episode before syncoping out, we suspect tachycardia, we induce, we do EP study to look for induction of arrhythmias, both uh, supraventricular arrhythmias as well as ventricular arrhythmias. So coming to the treatment of syncope, uh, main thing is we should not uh, miss out on uh, 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 like uh, conditions which can cause uh, uh, cardiac events with a later, like a LQT. Satish, uh, uh, can we be a little crisp because uh, therapies maybe we can bring in discussion, uh, investigations you want to discuss or you are close to that, whichever way. 
Yes, uh, so the one, one thing what we commonly encounter is uh, the reflex syncope, uh, where there be classical prodromal uh, symptoms with the loss of consciousness. If it is very clear, we can ask the patient to do some counter pressure. Do, even during time of uh, prodromal symptom, they do some counter pressure maneuvers so that syncopal episode can be aborted or they can lie down to supine position where the episode can be terminated. Mm -hmm. If uh, the patient is on multiple anti drugs, if you think it is hypotension related, we can stop hypotensive drugs. And coming for indication of uh, pacing, if there is a clear cut documented asystole causing uh, synco, uh, then there is a need for uh, pacing. The, uh, the role of uh, uh, drugs like, uh, like fludrocortisone or midodrone is a uh, uh, class 2P indication. So coming to conclusion, Symptom, a syncope is a symptom, it's not a diagnosis. A detailed history is important in evaluation of syncope, which is often neglected. And also history from the bystander, which is available, is very important. A thorough physical examination complements the history during evaluation. And also we should correlate the symptom and ECG to come for a conclusion. A stepwise approach result in low, uh, low cost with high diagnostic field in the evaluation of syncope. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. That was an excellent and very comprehensive presentation. It's a very long topic and one can talk for hours on Sincapi. You've done a very good uh, job in summarizing the whole thing. Uh, one thing which you mentioned in the indications of uh, uh, EP study is asymptomatic sinus bradycardia. Uh, how would you interpret uh, the findings of EP study in that setting? Or was it in reference to Sincapi? Yes, sir. So then, that's not syncope, asymptomatic. then that is not asymptomatic sinus bradycardia. No, so in, in, re, with reference, with reference to syncope, we like, we like to evaluate, sir. Yeah, that's fine. Because the it said it read asymptomatic sinus bradycardia. No, with reference now to syncope. To the, yeah, we move on to the next section. That is uh, case discussions on syncope, common situations. And I think Dr. Chetan is going to present that or... Who will be presenting the cases? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Ah, now Chetan is uh, going to present first, uh, followed by uh, me. Yeah. Okay. Followed by Abhinav. Yeah. Anil, here, Anil, here I'll request you that you can interrupt and, uh, you know, get the relevant sure. questions sure. answered so that uh, things Certainly. in a more uh, interesting fashion. We, what, what we can do is we can finish the case presentation and then go to a session where we can have, you know, discussion about the whole concept of syncope. Okay. where we can bring in uh, the opinion. That will keep the flow very smooth. Yeah, Dr. Abhinav, how many cases do you have? I think we need to uh, <clears throat> speed up a bit. We, we, are in nine we, we have two cases, I think. Um, so if we can just, uh, we'll just speed it up. Not a problem. Great. Abhinav, uh, be brief and then quick. Yes. <laughs> I can go to the slideshow start. Requesting everybody to keep their um, mics on mute because we are hearing coughing and people advising everybody else. Thank you. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible, Chetan. Downstairs there's their slide show. Which, yeah. Is it seen, sir? Yes, very much. Okay. Let's start. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Chetan Anil Bure, doing a, uh, uh, for HSR Bangalore. So we have three interesting cases today. I'll start with the first case. Uh, this is Chetan, a, oh, Chetan, yes. Chetan present one case and let Abhinav present one case. We don't have time for three cases. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we have 42 year old female with no history of prior comorbidity. She presented to us with history of dyspnea and exertion functional class 2 since last eight months. She also had a six episodes of loss of consciousness since last four months. These episodes usually occur at rest preceded by dizziness and feeling of a missed beat. Episode usually lasts for 15 to 20 minutes. There is no uh, abnormal body movement or focal deficit of frothing from the mouth 
or there is any sort of tongue bite during the episode there was no aura or precipitating factor like pain fear or emotional stress during the uh, uh, episode so by history typically our patient had a synco so we uh, uh, we started evaluating the patient slides uh, so on physical examination the pulse was 80 beats per minute regular bp was 120 by 80 ml per of mercury with no posture or fall general and systemic examination was were normal including the cardiac examination this was the baseline ecg which was recorded it is a normal sinus rhythm with one s one conduction with left bundle current block part one this was the chest x ray pau of the patient which was suggestive of the mild cardiomegaly of the patient so we have further procedure to do the 2d echocardiogram which was suggestive of the dilated left ventricle dimension was 5.6 by 4.2 global hypokinesis of lv with ejection fraction of 40% mild mr mild tr rv was also dilated with the mild rv dysfunction fab size was 15 and tsc was 28 mm of mercury uh, still we were not sure about the cause of the synco as baseline ecg has been left under front block so we did the whole turn 24 hour turn for the patient and which was normal the baseline blood investigation we are also uh, fairly normal so to summarize we had a 42 year old female with moderate lv systolic dysfunction with recurrent episodes of syncopatris in the sitting posture so after our basic investigation we have narrowed down our diagnosis that patient is probably having the arrhythmic synco and plus background lv dysfunction so it is a cardiac synco only and arrhythmic synco and uh, but It, uh, we were still unclear that it is which arrhythmia is precipitating the symptoms. Either bradyarrhythmia or tachyarrhythmia. So, as the patient had a background LV dysfunction, the coronary angiogram was done. That turned out to be normal. So, as patient coronary angiogram was normal. so we had a patient who had a non ischemic dtm so for further evaluation of non ischemic lv dysfunction we proceed uh, proceed with to do cardiac mri and we found out the interesting finding of the presence of left gadolinium enhancement mainly in the septal region plus uh, anterolateral inferior area plus there is also involvement of rv as seen in these images also there is also involvement of some areas of papillary muscles also So, uh, final report that of cardiac MRI was global hypokinesis of left ventricle with severely depressed left ventricular and RV systolic function. There is a sub BP cardiac, late myocardial, late gadolinium enhancement with non-ischemic, non-transmodular scar pattern in the basal and mid anteroseptal, anterolateral, apical, anterior, and lateral areas. Also, there is a sub endocardial LGE in the superior portion of papillary muscle and RV free wall. So the conclusion was according to that that the patient had a chronic myocarditis with the features in the favor of the granulomatous myocarditis. So this patient, uh, we are still know that we have got a patient who had a synco, probably arrhythmic. Patient had inflammatory cardiomyopathy, but we are still unclear that what is the cause of synco. It, it is which arrhythmia is the precipitating the synco? Either it is uh, bradyarrhythmia or tachyarrhythmia. So we came to conclude that uh, we will uh, try to do uh, EP study for the patient to look for basic AV conduction or uh, try to uh, induce any arrhythmia which is uh, which is causing the symptom clinical arrhythmia. So as patient was posted for the uh, EP study, patient has developed a similar episode of uh, episode while in the hospital. An ECG was taken that time. It was uh, suggestive of Uh, intermittent 2s to 1 AV block. With intermittent, there is a resumption of the sinus rhythm. However, again there is a 2s to 1 AV block. So for further evaluation, we have undergone the PET scan of the patient to localize the inflammation. Uh, which areas are involved? Either it is systemic or it is only cardiac part that is involved. 
the final price safety report which we got is like there is an involvement of uh, Bethel and Bethel Capital. Chetan, is... Chetan, hurry up, please, because there is another presentation. Please hurry up and yes, yes, yes. summarize everything. Is there is a uh, uh, so big effect of okay. the national lymphoma was also seen. So for that, uh, we came to conclusion that it's gynomatous disease. So we have to rule out the most common causes of tuberculosis. So that was the evaluation of Montu test and Contiparent test was negative. As patient had a medicinal lymph node, the biopsy was taken, which was suggestive of uh, non-necrotizing gynomatous lesion. And section for uh, AFD tuberculosis was negative. There was no malignant cells. So our have uh, confirmed the diagnosis that patient had a cardiac sarcoidosis. Our this is the flow chart. And our patient please, was treating please, that please patient. go to the please go to the patient details. Please skip this place. Okay. Go so ahead. After exactly. this, we have decided to insert the dual uh, dual chamber ICD for the patient as patient had a complete heart loss. Let's list for future events. Uh, after discharge, three weeks after the discharge, patient was started on the prednisone one milligram per kg and anti heart failure medication. Patient is now at six months of follow up and doing well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So this is a take-home message from the other case that inflammatory cardiomyopathies are rare, but important cause of synco. High index of suspicion is necessary in young patient presenting with this uh, synco. Both Brady and tachyarrhythmic events can cause synco. 24-hour holter has a low sensitivity, as in our case. And cardiac MRI and PET CT are valuable tool in evaluating the patient with the suspected inflammatory cardiomyopathy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think very nice case. So uh, right from the history, in the first slide, uh, yes, when you say that the patient presented with history of breathlessness for last uh, few months, yes, uh, that itself uh, points toward the diagnosis of uh, cardiac uh, syncope, some organic, some organic cause. Yes, so I think it is very important to understand for the fellows that uh, one of the most important point is when a patient presents in emergency with syncope, we need to at that point triage and segregate patients into two categories one who can be released from emergency and who can be asked to attend syncope clinic in opd and those who need to be hospitalized for in hospital monitoring that is the most important uh, decision to be made in emergency and uh, here in this case it became quite evident uh, as you said the episodes occurred you've not mentioned the posture now posture at the time of syncope is very important you said episodes occur at rest right. you uh, must define the posture whether it was always upright or if patient has syncope while lying down that further points towards uh, uh, okay. non reflex syncope okay. But this was quite evident from this slide itself that the patient is probably suffering from some organic cause, some cardiac syncope. Yes, sir. Then, uh, of course, uh, we go. Any other uh, question from in the chat box? Anil? Yeah. Can we go to the next case and then yeah, come we can. And then we can have a discussion. Yeah, sure. We can sure. sort of uh, look at the various aspects of syncope and put it in a perspective. <laughs> Definitely. Doctor. Yeah, it's because the screen sharing. I mean, how will take care? Hey, thanks, yeah. You just made my day. Okay. So, uh, Chetan, switch off and Abhinav, you come in, please. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good. Good morning, everyone, respected teachers. Uh, I may. Uh, Chetan, can you please uh, stop sharing the screen so that Chetan has to stop sharing the screen. Uh, I'm Dr. Abhinav Anand. I'm an EP fellow in the uh, Jadeva Institute of uh, Cardiovascular Sciences, Bangalore. I'll be presenting the next case. Uh, So uh, my case is of a uh, uh, 61-year-old female who had uh, uh, transient uh, loss of consciousness. Uh, patient had two episodes of uh, transient loss of consciousness uh, uh, within one week of presentation. Both uh, episodes were present at less rest and it lasted for around 30 seconds to one minute. Uh, during the last uh, episode, patient was sitting at the edge of her bed and fell down. Uh, and this resulted in 
head injury. This prompted a visit to a doctor. Uh, there was no history of uh, chest pain, palpitation prior to synco, no history of weakness, involuntary movement of the limbs or head injury. Uh, the past history was uh, significant for presence of hypertension for, for which uh, the patient was on uh, a combination of telmisartan and chlorothaladone. Uh, she was also on metformin 500 mg twice daily for her diabetes. And uh, she was a known case of uh, epilepsy on tablet levetiracetam uh, 500 mg twice daily. Uh, family history, there was uh, nothing significant except uh, that uh, her sister had a history of heart attack at the age of uh, 67 years. Uh, at the time of presentation, the details were not available. Uh, for her uh, uh, fall followed by uh, head injury, she went to her neurologist for, with wh whom she was following up for her epilepsy treatment. Uh, she was subsequently admitted to the intensive care unit for monitoring and for the evaluation. Uh, while monitoring, uh, the physician noticed that uh, there were frequent VPCs uh, on the monitor. Uh, subsequently, the patient was started on IV amiodarone for her ventricular premature beats. Four hours after starting the amiodarone treatment, the patient had an episode of polymorphic VT, which was witnessed on monitor. She was subsequently defibrillated and uh, referred to our institute. When the patient came to our institute, she was conscious cooperative. Pulse was uh, 92 beats per minute regular. Uh, BP was 150 by 84 uh, millimeters of mercury in right upper arm supine position with no postural drop. There was no carotid view. Uh, cardiovascular examination was unremarkable. Lab investigations were significant for the presence of hypokalemia. Uh, her magnesium levels were in normal range. She had normal hemogram, well-controlled diabetes, and liver and uh, kidney functions were normal. Uh, 2D echo was unremarkable. She had uh, normal... Abhi now, Abhi now, please go on to only essential things because we yes. are out of time. Okay? Yes, Is it essential? Just go to that. Yes, sir. So this was the ECG taken, which showed normal sinus rhythm, one is to one conduction, uh, uh, heart rate of 72 beats per minute, normal axis, with prolonged QT with a corrected QT interval of 613 millisecond. Uh, to summarize, a 61-year-old female with known case of hypertension, diabetes, and epilepsy presented with synco, had polymorphic PT, which was precipitated by hypokalemia. Uh, when she came to our institute, we, uh, her medications were removed. Uh, the clothalidone was stopped. She was started on IV potassium supplement and uh, uh, as well as IV magnesium supplement. A uh, temporary pacemaker was inserted and she was uh, paced with a backup rate of 100 beats per minute. Uh, then uh, in spite of correction of her potassium as well as magnesium, her QT interval continued to be prolonged. So we started her on tablet propanolol, which was slowly titrated up to 320 milligrams per day. Uh, she was counseled for ICD implantation, but uh, the patient and the relatives refused due to uh, financial constraints. Uh, the, we asked the sisters to come visit the hospital, but uh, they could not come because of uh, the COVID restrictions. However, she was kind enough to send her discharge paper by WhatsApp. Uh, if you note, the sister also had a presence of long QT on her ECG uh, with her Q corrected QTC came out to be around 597 millisecond by Bazet formula. However, she was diagnosed to be a non-Q anterior wall MI with 50% recanalized retin and was being treated as ACS with non-Q MI. Uh, in our index patient, we sent the genetic analysis, uh, which was suggestive of uh, uh, pathogenic mutation in KC and H2. So she was basically a long QT syndrome type 2. Uh, she was subsequently taken for left uh, cervical sympathetic denervation. And post LSCD at three months of follow up, she did not have any recurrence of synco. So if we have time, I can uh, quickly go in two slides about the diagnosis and uh, the uh, management of long QT. So the diagnosis is basically based on SWAS criteria. 
uh, with a risk of with a score of more than 3.5 in the absence of secondary causes or presence of pathogenic mutation or uh, in the absence of secondary cause if qt interval is more than 500 millisecond uh, this is the source score which is uh, divided into three groups ecg finding clinical history and family history uh, with uh, uh, a qtc more than 450 460 to 479 or 480 qtc at 4 minutes of recovery from exercise uh, test torsards tv alterans nosh tv and low heart rate for age uh, in the ecg finding clinical history of synco or congenital mm -hmm. deafness and a family member with a definite uh, LQT. Uh, these are the recommendation on management. So uh, it, it is skip this so because skip this uh, syncope. individual yes. disease entities causing syncope. Uh, I think we cannot discuss. We don't we have cannot to discuss. So, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is my final slide. Uh, a thorough history taking is important in every case. For example, in this case, Although the sister was diagnosed with her MI, when we looked at her papers, we realized that it is actually long QT and not uh, an MI. Uh, second is patient with congenital long QT syndrome can present at a later stage. For example, our patient presented for the first time at the age of 61 years, which was uh, uh, probably precipitated by the drug and the electrolyte abnormality. And amiodarone should not be indiscriminately used in cases of ventricular tachycardia. Thank you. <clears throat> Interesting case, uh, Abhinav, particularly you, because when, you know, this is a typical situation when, when a patient presents very late <clears throat> at, the, at the age of 60, okay. 65, and uh, for the first time and having two syncopies uh, uh, in a very short interval, one usually suspects some arrhythmic cause. And yes, uh, it was arrhythmic, but uh, presentation of long QT syndrome at late age is, is a bit uncommon. Of course, it can present. And in this instance, it was uh, precipitated by electrolyte imbalance. <clears throat> so I think we have 10 minutes for discussion. Uh, do we have any questions in the chat box? Uh, there are some questions, I think. Uh, yeah. uh, is about atrial pacing right yeah. versus icd that can be some discussion so obviously there, there are there are some questions on uh, cardiac sarcoidosis whether anup wants to discuss now since this is a teaching class can i take over a little bit as a teacher i'm sure that all of you would. See, for, for, for all for all most of I, i'm sure that this is for um i uh, the dm dnb program so, uh, there are two ways to approach a syncope so here, I am not doing it as an electrophysiologist. When we approach a syncope, we should be just a physician. And probably the most important uh, thing in syncope is history taking, which most of us do not want to do. You want to do chest pain, coronary angiogram. You have giddiness, you send it to Dr. J. Prakash. It should not be so. I would suggest that the students spend some time interviewing the patient. The first question in syncope, when they come with giddiness or anything, I teach my students, the first question to ask the patient is, have you fallen down to the ground? If the patient says no, there is no question of syncope because patient has to lose consciousness and fall to the ground. Otherwise, one has to ask specific questions, but do not ask leading questions because if it's a pseudo-syncope, every single question will take you down the wrong way. So. One of the most important uh, things for students of DMDNB is history taking, which is a lost art. So it gives you almost 50 to 60% of the diagnosis of how the patient has had syncope or whether, so we call this not initially as a syncope, we call it as a transient loss of consciousness. Amongst them, it could be a traumatic or a non-traumatic or pseudo cause. So these are the three different causes of, uh, you know, a transient loss of consciousness. And in the non-traumatic causes, syncope is one of the causes. So it could have a number of, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, basic causes which goes into it. Number, there is a question regarding when should you, should you all evaluate for, uh, you know. Uh, JP, uh, excuse me, JP, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Yeah. JP, before you go to the uh, chat box, can I add to what you said? Absolutely. 
I think what JP said hits the nail on the head. All students, when any registrar presents syncopy at bedside, the syncopy gets over usually in two sentences, and then the next line is echo showed this. This is a most. This is wrong, wrong, and wrong. Correct. Absolutely. Every episode of syncopy. What time of day it happened? What was the position of the patient? What was the fasting state or not? Were there premonitory symptoms? Lakde ke jaise gira ke kapde ke jaise gira. Did he droop to the ground or did he abruptly fall to the ground? Was there injury? Did anybody check the pulse? Was there paleness? Was there cyanosis? Was there incontinence? If there were convulsive movements, were they like an epileptic or were they non-specific and short? I mean. Was the recovery prompt and was the patient made to lie down or was he kept in the sitting position? I think every detail of every episode of syncope is most important and spend time on it. Most of the diagnosis will be made by a careful and detailed history. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Absolutely, I, I totally agree with you, Yash. But you know, today it's a time where people have lost the art of asking questions. People want to immediately do a procedure, which includes right from echo. And many a times they do, a, they do not want to do the ECG because ECGs are very difficult to interpret. Now, one of the clues I want to introduce you, if uh, uh, Chetan can show a thumb, uh, uh, um, something which people can easily pick up is if the QT interval is equivalent to 50% of the RR interval, then you should be very cautious so just look at all the 12 leads and look at the QT interval at any in any lead if the QT interval is equivalent to 50% of the RR interval, then immediately suspect a long QT syndrome because it can present to us, especially in our country, many a times this would have gone unrecognized for a long period of time. And if T wave inversions are there, invariably the default diagnosis is coronary artery disease and after a coronary angiogram, it is either a recanalized, uh, you know, LAD, recanalized RCA. So you can see this very carefully. If you look at this, these are about one, two, three, and four, four large squares. And you can see about two large squares are the, is the QT interval. So if you see this, the moment you see this, and even here, you can see even on a, this is a sort of a halter, but nevertheless, if it is 50% of the RR interval. That's a clue that this patient has got long QT. So go back to Bezet's formula, Frederica's formula, whatever formula you want to calculate the QTC. So that's a very important thing. And nevertheless, we, why we wanted to highlight this case was please do not give amiodarone recklessly. We are probably trying to kill patients by recklessly giving amiodarone and other antiarrhythmic drugs trying to suppress the VPCs. VPCs need to be looked at very carefully. Most do not require treatment. Those that do, re do require treatment do not require amiodarone. So these are very, very important points. Please, I request um, DM and DNB fellows not to use amiodarone and antiarrhythmics recklessly. Number really? three, number three, if you are going to use a beta blocker, in long QT, uh, metoprolol is not, long acting metoprolol is not the drug. So you should use preferably nedolol, which is not available in India because it's a, it, it has got, uh, it's a non-selective beta blocker. The next best choice is um, propranolol and do not use homeopathic doses of drugs. Use good high dose of drugs to prevent recurrence. Now the question of AI pacing comes in AI pacing can be used if bradycardia is going to induce, um, you know, um, uh, long QT and torsade. But nevertheless, in our country, in good centers, left cardiac sympathetic nerve denervation, we have had excellent results, including Yash would uh, vouch for that, and it gives a very good protection for these patients, even in the absence of ICD. What do you say, Yash? Yes, JP. In uh in long QT syndrome, especially in our country, but even I feel all over the world, uh, you're talking of long QT specifically, correct? JP? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, a very underutilized and very simple, very simple in surgeon, in an experienced surgeon's hand is sympathectomy. 
in a child also it can be easily done open if you don't want to do videoscopic and it is really a life saving option in symptomatic patients children or even adults with long qt whether to do only left side or whether to do bilateral is a matter but at least get it done even if you do unilateral though my personal feeling is that a bilateral is better but sympathectomy is the treatment of choice in children or adults with long qt who have syncope despite beta blocker ah uh, one more question dr yadav is asking please do not use you know selective beta blockers in these patients these do not have a role so bisoprolol uh, highly selective beta blockers like uh, nebulol they all do not have a role they have never been tested most of the testing most of the this thing which have been which have come out is nadolol is the best second is if you do not have it propranolol is what you should give and use the maximum tolerated dose if possible Sure. Thanks, JP. Can we get on with the next uh, half of the session? This lady was treated as epilepsy. In fact, uh, epilepsy may be this aborted SCD. Maybe absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So many a times we receive this, and in fact, I have quite a few cases where patients have been given anti-epileptic drugs who are resistant, who later come back and come back as not only long QT but would have had other channelopathies, including CPVT and various other channelopathies. So it's easily missed. Thank you, Dr. JP. Nice comments. now uh, i think we can move to the next session and i'll request dr anup to take over for the next session yeah thank you anil good morning everybody uh, so the next session is very very important ciid infection which uh, it's it's becoming uh, definitely a problem so it's a reverse way like you know in this session we will have a case presentation first for 15 minutes then uh, professor uh, jay prakash will deliver his talk for 20 minutes and uh, my uh, request is like you know let the let uh, finish the case and then uh, let dr uh, professor jp finish his talk and then we'll take all the question and we'll have discussion so over to you jp again yeah i agree with you i agree with you whatever you say you are the boss okay as you should let the case presentation uh, get started Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Sanjay Jacob, uh, EP Fellow at uh, Sri Jayadev Institute of Cardiovascular Science and Research. Uh, I'll be presenting the case of uh, challenging case of lead extraction. So, our patient was a 92-year-old female with uh, comorbidities of rheumatoid arthritis and interstitial lung disease. She was actually on home oxygen therapy. Uh, her room air saturation was only 90, uh, 88. she is also uh, had underwent a ppi ddd for post op chp following a uh, pabg in 1995 it was an uh, she had an unanswerable pg replacement done in 2008 uh, she had gone for an elective pg replacement in june 2020 where they felt there was a loss of rb capture due to high threshold and uh, so they decided to uh, downgrade the uh, the pacemaker to vvi with only a pre pulse generator and an additional rb lead implantation uh, i put the parameters for the high threshold on the right side it was done on the same side of the previous ppi which is on the right and uh, the old ra and rb leads were kept so one month post procedure uh, it was realized that the patient had a lead dislodgement so uh, the lead was repositioned in july 2020 Sam, your slides are not seen. Yeah, we cannot see the slides. We cannot yeah. see the slides. Okay, sir. Can you share the screen? Yeah, I'll share the screen. Yeah, 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 Yeah. So one month post procedure, the patient uh, developed lead dislodgement. The lead was repositioned in July 2020. Following which, she slowly developed a discharge from the pocket. So they took it back. Uh, took her back in for another thing. They removed the 
old in the new pg there was new percentage of new lead was put uh, while keeping the old lead in situ at the same time they also implanted a leadless pacemaker in the same setting then she was referred to a institute because of non healing of the uh, pocket along with pyrrolin discharge for from august till november that's around 5 to 6 months so when she came to a hospital this is how the pocket looked uh she had the leads which were uh, eroded the pocket and the leads were actually visible outside she also was in cardiac failure with an nrh class 4 her nt probmp levels were 5274 the pus culture that we did uh, showed pyromonas erogenosa sensitive to piperacillin tazobactam and uh, we also looked at what the leads were the leads were actually a passive fixation in rv and an active fixation lead in rv her echo admission showed uh, a normal lv dimension but her es was down to 37% global dysfunction was seen she had a moderate tr partly because of the interstitial lung disease that she had and partly because of the uh, lead being there and mild rv dysfunction was seen we also did a transesophageal echo for her there were no lead vegetations or any mass in the heart this is other Im uh, imaging that we did this is a ct showing the position of the uh, the leads and uh, this is the uh, the bottom pictures of the ct show the leads in the svc uh, if you look closely we can actually make out that the leads are uh, adherent to the svc wall we also got a pet ct done which showed a high metabolic activity in the pocket which is uh, followed by the arrow there uh, one one minute one moment go back to the pet uh, just a you have to see that the patient has had a leadless pacemaker and there is no intense metabolic activity inside the heart so this is really important because what we are going to do next is so then uh, before we took the patient up for any procedure we had to actually control a heart failure symptoms that took us around 10 days for reducing a heart failure symptoms she required bypass ventilation for a week she was also given levisim and an infusion we optimized all her heart failure medications and before taking up we had given the bias uh, her relatives two options one was a high risk lead extraction or if at all they didn't want to go with the lead extraction they what they could continue with antibiotics stress things and pain killers but uh, luckily enough the patient's uh, relatives went for the lead extraction so this is the uh, ra and the lao views of uh, pre procedure of both the leads and during we took the patient under ga uh, we also had a real time transesophageal echo monitoring happening during the same time we took two axes from the right femoral vein also we had actually passed a wire into the svc and kept a balloon there in case of an emergency uh the procedure we did is dissect the lead plane we used a lead lighting stylet passed into the uh into the lead and a cutting sheet was passed over the lead so this is how the procedure was done i'll just play the video a little fast on the left is the passive fixation rv lead the stroscopic images of it going through this going a little fast so you can actually you can also see the leadless pacemaker which is in situ there and uh, we successfully removed both the leads and uh, this is the images of the lead uh, this was the upper one is your rv tiny lead and the lower one is the ra which is the screw in lead post procedure this is just a comparison of the patient pre procedure and post procedure we actually kept a drain for 2 days and uh, she had an uneventful post procedure recovery and this is a patient 4 months on follow up on her granddaughter's birthday celebration she is quite happy with the procedure so our take home message will be 
remove all the infected CIEDs that is there. Reimplantation requires a high, much higher antiseptic precautions. Avoid multiple interventions at the same site. In failed individuals, consider subpectoral pacemaker implantation. If there is an active in infection, do not implant a leadless pacemaker. And age is not a barrier for lead extraction, especially if done by an experienced operator. Thank you. Uh, wonderful case, Sam. So I'll request Dr. JP to present this case. So meanwhile, he loads. So the take-home message again from a case, like many of the centers, what they do, they cut the lead and try to get it buried inside the vein. Don't do that. If you're not extracting, leave the lead so that you can send to an expert operator. So it, uh, the removal of the leads are much better with that. So JP, you can present your case and then we'll come back to the case. Can you see my slides? Yes, Hello? go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> now, without um, wasting much time, uh, we will go into this topic. Uh, um, first of all, I would like to thank the IHRS for having given Jaydev an opportunity to present. Today, we decided we will present something which is not covered usually, which is syncope and CID infections, which we deal quite commonly. Now, I am going to speak in the next 20 minutes about CID infections because these are becoming quite common uh, these days as more and more implanters which less and less experience implant uh, devices. And uh, we are getting quite sick patients which have been managed inappropriately uh, after wasting a lot of money. Some of them would have wasted at least about five to six lakh rupees. Uh, before they come to us and they are literally without money to undergo a lead extraction or a device reimplantation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put two parts together. One is the device infection P, how to avoid it because prevention is better than cure. The second is afterwards, what should you do and how should you approach to a patient with device infection? Now, we have to realize that in the West, we have, where we have data, the overall incidence is about 0.5 to 2.2%. However, in, in our center, where we do about 600 to 700 implants continuously, we have been doing it for more than about 12 years now, our infection rates are very low because we follow a very strict protocol, which I'll share with you. The incidence of, the incidence of infection is about two to five fold higher when you do a device replacement rather than in a patient who undergoes a de novo implantation. And in patients who develop a cardiac implantable device infection or device related infection, it is also called as, the mortality is quite high if they are not treated properly. The in-hospital mortality can be about two to 15% and about six months later, it can be four to 30% and at one year it can be nine to 35%. And most importantly, it's a very, very expensive treatment because not only do you have to extract the lead where the sheath itself costs about two and a half lakh rupees in, a, in our center, plus the lead locking stylet costs about 75,000. So for one lead, you require one stylet. So if you have multiple leads, you require multiple stylets plus the ICD, plus the antibiotics, plus the stay, plus the reimplantation is a huge cost. So if you have a patient with infection, please refer early not to do multiple admission. And we have to realize majority of the CID infection requires complete explantation of the whole system. You can't leave anything behind. Now there are certain risk factors for device related infection, which could be grouped into three groups, which are the perioperative factors, the device factors and the host factors. The perioperative factors would involve use of temporary pacemakers, especially if it is a long standing temporary pacemaker, which has been there, lack of antibiotic prophylaxis, prolonged operative time, which usually happens with an inexperienced operator. And most importantly, if the operator does less than 30 implants a year, it has been shown that they have a very high risk of infection. And post-operative pocket hematoma and superficial implants, especially in children, as well as older people, uh, uh, re results in device erosion and infection. And device factors could be CRT, CRTD, CRT, ICD, which 
are quite complex, take longer procedure times, abdominal implants and epicardial leads have higher infection rates. While as the host factors, so please, if you have a central venous catheter, please get rid of it as early as possible. Tell your anesthetist or anybody to have as many less, as less catheters as possible. If there is a distance focus of infection, like a, you know, um, a diabetic foot or something, please do not do anything until the infection is under control. Do not advise any invasive procedures around the time of CID implant. And patients who are diabetic, CKD, and older age have a higher risk of implants. And even those with who are on steroids or immunosuppression and malignancy have higher risk of, of in, uh, you know, infections. Uh, also, patients who are on anticoagulants, if they are not managed very well, they can develop hematoma and infections. Now, having said that, the pathogenesis can happen. It can happen in various ways. That is, the infection can happen prior to implantation because when a person is handling the device in the lab, when he's handing it over to you in the device, it can get infected. Or if the operating theater, which, which is the cat lab usually, usually is not very well ventilated and usually many, many a times people don't even wear the caps and masks and enter and exit out some of the labs where I have seen even they enter it with, with their shoes on from the roadside. So these are the places which is likely to increase the risk of in, in plant, uh, infection. If during the implantation, a poor technique and a long procedure can in, increase the risk of infection and a, a surgical site infection can occur due to the patient's own skin contamination. There can be hematogenous searing from a distant site and also contamination can occur after skin erosion. So all erosions literally mean that the device is infected. Very rarely, there can be a problem during manufacturing and this results in what is called as a cluster infection with a very unusual organism. So we could divide prevention. I would call this as prevention because these are the most important things that you should do when you are doing, which we follow. And I expect that the students who are there, the DMD and the students, I'm going to spend a little time there. This is not for the experienced people who would already be doing. So these are pre-procedure measures. So first is just confirm that it, the patient really requires a cardiac implantable device. If it does not require many a times you try to do this device, they get infected. Delay the implantation in patients with infection. So there should be at least fever free for at least 24 to 48 hours with normal counts. Avoid a temporary pacemaker or a central venous line. If there are central venous line, remove it prefer preferably before you implant the device and put in a peripheral IV line. You avoid pocket hematoma. So please do not bridge with heparin. So please do not bridge with heparin. If the patient is on a vitamin K antagonist, it is our preference to do it on an INR of 1.8 to 2. So what we do is we start doing an INR every day withholding the uh, vitamin K antagonist. When it is about 1.8 to 2, we go ahead and do it. There is no problem. Avoid periprocedural low molecular weight heparin. If you give it, you are assured of a hematoma in the pocket and then that hematoma gets in infected perform the procedure in a completely sterile environment. Do not allow anybody to enter without a cap and mask. See that the, this thing is uh, completely sterile. Hair removal should preferably be with the electrical clippers. So avoid using razors because this can cause micro damage to the skin, which increases the risk of infection. And you can even do the electrical clipping only if it is interfering with the site where you're going to do just clip it very minimally using an electrical clipper with a disposable uh, you know, uh, tip. So try not to abrade the skin with razors and you can even do the uh, removal of hair just before you take the patient. Antibiotic prophylaxis should preferably be cefazolin or uh, flucoxacillin, one to two grams, 60 minutes before the procedure. Or if you're giving IV vancomycin, it is one to 1.5 grams. Uh, 90 to 120 minutes before the time of incision. So this is very important. Now, there are certain periprocedural measures which I am going to highlight on. Routine pre-surgical washing with an antimicrobial agent can be given. So you can ask them to take a, a povidone iodine wash or 
you can ask them to take an alcoholic chlorhexidine wash and come. Uh, skin preparation is preferably with alcoholic chlorhexidine rather than povidine iodine. So I'm telling this because with povidine iodine, the risk of infection is much higher than with alcoholic chlorhexidine. What we do is when the patient comes on the table, we just spray the area with chlorhexidine solution and allow it to dry before we start draping the patient. Before we start painting the patient, we do it once more with chlorhexidine before we drape the patient. Allow sufficient time to dry. So don't put it on a wet, don't put everything on a wet, wet thing. And then use an adhesive incised drape. So it's our, uh, we always use an uh, uh, iodine impregnated incised drapes to cover the area so that the skin does not um, cause infection. Now, in case the operator performs the prepping and draping, remove the gloves. And if you are going to put a temporary pacemaker from the groin, you de-scrub completely and then re-scrub again. If you are wearing a double glove, remove the double glove after you have prepped and draped. Preferably use a powder fig glove. I use a powder fig glove because I'm allergic to talcum, so I use it uh, automatically. It reduces the risk of infection. So it's very important to follow this during. During the, during the procedure, please do not puncture from the skin for venous excess because this makes the lead very superficial for erosion. A proper incision is a must and there should be no hesitant cuts and minimize tissue damage. Your, your incision and your handling of tissue should be very good and achieve good hemostasis. And do not open the hardware and keep it on the table. So you just have to, suppose you want to put in the lead, open the lead from, uh, from the, you know, uh, the packet just before you put it in. Do not leave the device open to air for a long time on your table. During PG replacement, avoid capsulectomy. So you should not take out the capsule because it causes a lot of bleeding and hematoma. And during replacement, avoid cutting leads. The pocket is very important. It is extremely important that the pocket be made medially. What I see is pocket is made very laterally and it causes erosion. So the pocket should be made between the fascia and the muscle. So do not make the prepectoral pocket in the fat. So you should lift the fascia from the uh, pectoralis major muscle and make a pocket. This in a thin individual such as older people or very thin individuals or in children, go for a subpectoral pocket. If you can't do it, call the surgeon to make it for you. And make a pocket medially. I'm telling this again and again. Most of the erosions happen on the lateral aspect because the pockets have been made laterally. Do not make the pocket right at the beginning and put your gauze into it. It is quite likely it will cause infection. So the lesser the time you keep the wound open to air, the lesser the chances of infection. It is our uh, this thing, it's my training to preach. And I have been trained that way in the Royal Melbourne to create, create pocket right at the end, just before we put in the, uh, the device. Local installation of antibiotics is not recommended these days. And in patients who are high risk, like those patients who are CKD or diabetes or risk of infection is high, you can use a, a antibiotic envelope, which is available. It is not usually for all patients that you, sh you should use it. Because if you want to prevent one infection, you have to use 10, 10 of these envelopes, which are quite expensive. Now sutures, avoid braided sutures. Do not use sutures such as the silk to do the wound closure in layers. So use monofilament sutures to close the wound. And if you are doing this, you know, uh, silk sutures, uh, it is quite likely, more likely that they can get infected. Now, having said that, there are certain post-operative measures which you should use. You should avoid using long post-operative antibiotic therapy because whatever infection is going to happen is happening during the time of implant and then not again after that. And pressure dressing for 24 hours should be fine. Uh, dress for about two to 10 days. What we use nowadays is we use what is known as Mepilex, which is a soft silicone uh, you know, um, uh, dressing, which can be left there for about five days. So we just put Mepilex in and send the patient home. So our, tell the patients about wound care, not to get it uh, you know, dirty. Uh, then reconsider the case. Suppose you find that there is a sort of hematoma, avoid needling it, reconsider 10 times before you do something and refrain from doing the hematoma drainage. Some people try to squeeze it, 
some people try to press it, please do not do it. Unless there is a wound dehiscence or the, it is extremely tense, do not try to evacuate the hematoma. So these are certain measures which you use. For the diagnosis of device-related infection, you will have to use your clinical um, you know, uh, criteria, which is the local inflammation, discharge, fever, and embolic phenomena, especially if you have vertebral osteomyelitis and discitis in a patient who has got a device, think of a device-related infection. Identification of the organism is very important. So use blood cultures, at least two samples. It can also be done for isolation, can be done, isolation of the microorganisms can be done from the tissue and fluid cultures. And also when we extract the lead, we take the cultures from the distal, proximal lead fragments, vegetation, and the generator pocket tissue so that we isolate it. Imaging will come to this. So we use T for transthoracic echocardiography, trans-esophageal echocardiography, and in fact, intracardiac echocardiography, if you have it in your lab, it's very useful. In those patients whom we are in doubt, we use this uh, uh, F18, FD, PET, uh, PET CT, or we can use, we do not have this, the WPC spec is also very sensitive in identifying the site of infection. So we can categorize the device-related uh, infection into eight groups, depending on the clinical scenario, it could be superficial incisional infection, which is just a local infection. It could be isolated pocket infection, pocket erosion. Whenever there is an erosion, it always, almost always means that the device and the whole system is infected. It could be just bacteremia without nothing being shown elsewhere. So positive blood cultures. It could be pocket infection with bacteremia. Endocarditis using Duke's criteria, you can identify it with or without pocket infection. And sometimes you can have occult bacteremia. So there is no other source of bacteremia, but the patient has fever. And when you extract the device, it results. This again indicates a device-related infection. So this is some of the pictures you can see here. You can hardly see anything, but there is a uh, you know, infection in the pocket. You can see erosions. And as I've told you, erosions always, almost always happens on the very lateral aspect. So these are the various phases of device infection. And you can see that this patient has had a cut lead and it is pouring out from here and he has got a very big uh, you know, endocarditis lesion there. So this is the diagnostic algorithm which I'm going to share with you either with a positive blood culture or a negative culture. We have cl pocket clinically positive, pocket clinically negative. We use the trans thoracic and transesophageal echocardiography and optional is use of PET FTG, which we have been using more frequently these days to identify uh, infections. So if it's pocket negative, but there is a high clinical suspicion, use transthoracic transesophageal echocardiography with FDG. If the pocket is clinically not very good, but you think that there is an infection, again, one needs to think of and extracting this device. Now, how do we go about treating these patients? Once we have identified that the patient has got a device-related infection, identify whether it's a, just a local infection. If it's just a superficial in, uh, incisional infection, one can do a conservative treatment, um, you know, just by giving antibiotics. But if there is a definite or a possible CID infection, it requires complete removal of the device and all the leads and every hardware. These are the various imaging that we need to sort of consider when we are doing this the transthoracic, the transesophageal echo, the CT scan, the PET-FDG, and the chest x-rays and fluoroscopy. So if you have a superficial infection, the antibiotic therapy can be used. Depending on what you culture, you can give it for seven to 10 days. If there is a definite CID infection, you will have to remove the lead completely. If the blood culture is negative, the antibiotic therapy is usually for about 10 to 14 days. But if there is a systemic infection, you need to give four to six weeks after we remove the device. So when we do the lead remove, when we remove the when we do lead removal procedure, it could either be a lead explant procedure. Lead explant procedure is something where we do not use specialized tools like the lead lead uh, locking stylet or the cutting tools. We can use only the stylet, and this is usually possible in leads which have been having an indwell time of probably less than a year, usually about six months to eight months where they come in very early. 
but if it has been more than a year do not try to tug on the lead because the lead just fragments so if you just give a gentle tug if it doesn't come out leave it alone send it to a center which can do lead extraction do not put you know a lot of uh, you know tension on the lead the so re removal procedure could be transvenous from the superior approach or from the femoral approach it could be a open surgical approach also or it could be a hybrid procedure where we can do transvenous plus open surgical depending on what we find so we use various tools such as the mechanical cutting rotating tools or we use the snares or we can use the laser which are available these days the patients usually done in the ep laboratory or in a hybrid lab under ga so don't do it under local anesthesia active surgical standby is very essential you have to have the cpb right in place because if you tear the superior vena cava you just have about 5 minutes time to save the patient you have to have a continuous te throughout the procedure with continuous spo2 uh, we prep the whole chest and abdomen just like we do a bypass and we keep the bridge balloon as standby if it's available then we open the pocket dissect it out carefully remove the sutures right up to the entry site put a implantation till i try to pull it out unscrew the lead and try to gently pull it out if manual traction doesn't pull it out then we go on to the extraction procedure that was the explant procedure now we get to the explant extraction procedure if it is if we try to do a lead uh, simple gentle traction it doesn't come out then we extract the lead using one of the mechanical or laser cutting sheets if there are residual frag fragments we use snares to remove it either from the femoral or jugular approach and sometimes very occasionally if small pieces are left especially in infection we have to get everything out we may use a surgical extraction if parts are left behind so this is how we approach it and this is how it's already been shown to you this is a laser laser extraction the one which we you can see a bevel here this is a laser tool which we are using here the previous one was a mechanical tool so this is from the left side that the one which we showed previously was from the right side so you, so this is how the lead looks like many a times you get biopsies um, and you get tissues here so this is the extracted lead and when you do a replacement no part of the removed cid should, system should be reimplanted so many a times i get patients being told by the referring physician ask them to put back the old device because it's got battery please do not do it because again you can get it infected because there is a biofilm on the top of uh, you know these devices which uh, which harbor the microorganisms the lead has to be on the opposite side if a patient has is pacemaker dependent we use what is known as temporary permanent pacemaker where we use a permanent pacemaker and an external active fixation lead to keep the patient mobile for up to 10 to 14 or even up to 21 days till the cultures are negative so Uh, ladies and gentlemen um, cid infections are increasing with increasing number of implants being done proper implantation techniques probably avoids or decreases the number of infections the indications for lead extractions are well defined but it is not for a novice please let me tell you it is not for a novice and please do not cut the leads well proven extraction techniques are available complications are very infrequent if it is done properly and mortality is uncommon with experienced centers so thank you all for a patient hearing wonderful wonderful talk dr jp and i think you have made it so clear i i think everybody should note down the slides and they should implement in their own practice to add a few things what you suggested like you know simple thing which i wanted to convey to the dmd and the students is a uh, most of the student they think that you know the pacemaker putting at the leads is the most important see it's an art pacemaker putting I'm, I'm, sorry yes you are saying something anup can you yeah can i just tell something which is very you know which i really pains me every time i see it yes, yes go ahead i am sorry to say this but uh, anil jp i am sorry to say it but many of the residents who come to us to a joint cardiology do not are not well trained in basic sterility and hygiene concepts how, how to wash up how to even keep your hands up after you wash up how to wear the gloves without touching it with bare hands 
how to keep your hands up and not by the side touching here and there. I get panicky when I see this. So I think a orientation in the OT or in sterility for a few days is very important before they wash up for pacemaker. I'm sorry to say this, but it's. I I fully I fully agree with you, Yash. Like you know, in my in my setup, if anybody wants to do any device, he has to learn how to scrub and how to wear a gloves before doing any case at all. So I fully agree with you. That is, and in fact, you know, I'm I'm aghast to see in many places, you know, people even the cardiologists they don't put scrubs. They they come to do perform pacemaker in their routine dress, which they have put it at their home and just put a gown and then do the case and forget about scrubbing their hands and all this thing. Just a sterilium gloves and they start doing the procedure. So that's that's not done. So you to continue, wipe their hands thing, with the gown, you know. So the gown should be spotless after the procedure. That's what I tell my fellows. Your gown should not have any spot. Sometimes they wash their hands and wipe them with the with the gown uh, that they're wearing. That becomes the whole thing becomes unsterile. Now, now uh, I'll, I'll I'll answer certain questions which are there on the on the board. Now, yes. first thing is there are there are questions from Dr. Shivani Rao, Etal, Purva, and everything. Let me tell you, when you are using a dual antiplatelet, stop the clopidogrel at least minimum five days before you take up the procedure, unless it's an emergency. Number one, suppose if it's an elective procedure like a CRT, CRTD, stop clopidogrel. You can use a small dose, 75 milligram of aspirin. If you are using Novak, stop it on the day of the procedure so that it doesn't act and wait for a day or two. If, it's a, if a patient is on a VKA, just as I told you, just get the INR to about two. I have even done implants on INR of 2.5. That's fine with me. But it depends on how good you are in your hemostasis. Please do not express any hematoma. So anybody else says anything, please do not accept it. Do not press, do not express it, do not needle it, do not do anything. Allow it to resolve. Most of the times it resolves if it is small. If it becomes too tense and if it is going to burst out, then you might need to sort of do something. Now, there is an extraction. Rajiv Bharatbhaj is asking if you can extract epicardially, lead epicardially, non-surgically. No, you cannot extract a epicardial lead non-surgically. In case you think that the infection is very local, occasionally you can cut it and leave it. That has been suggested, but I would not do it because the infection spreads into the pericardium. So you have, it has to get out completely. So in a device infection, let me tell you, you have to get every single piece of device out. There is no way in which you are going to leave any piece inside. JP, uh, can you, can you, JP, can you? JP, can you differentiate? Yeah. JP, would you like to differentiate between a de novo procedure and a, and a, a generator replacement or a redo procedure uh, when it comes to CID infections? Yeah. See, when whenever we do a when we whenever whenever we do a patient who is de novo, uh, the infections are much lesser. But when you do a, a replacement, it is usually much higher because oh. when you when you dissect and keep the device in, it is not exactly in the old position and there is a risk of infection. The infection can appear immediately, that is within the first 30 days, or it could be happening between 30 days to 60 days, or it could happen between 60 days to a year. So it can vary any time. And most of the times, the ones which occur later are erosions. So what to do if a patient develops there is a question about what to do if a patient develops pocket hematoma and also on NOAC due to DVT. Then you have to look at whether the DVT risk is higher or if the risk of hematoma is higher. So if the patient doesn't have any DVT now, use physical measures to counter DVT, stop the NOAC, wait for the hematoma to resolve, do not needle it, and then you can re-switch re back to NOAC after the hematoma comes down. Now, JP, what is your protocol if you already have endocarditis on the valve? If you if you have endocarditis on the valve, you just remove the device and most of the time, once you take out the device and give them full antibiotic, the infection resolves. JP, what Dr. JP, Sathe probably means is that will the size of the vegetation not decide whether you yes. use a transcatheter way or an open surgical? Correct. Expand so if, on if that. It, 
if it is more than if it is more than if it is more than 2.5 centimeters we should probably consider an open surgical but most of the times it is quite smaller we have done up to about 2 centimeters which no problem but even now if you have a system called as an angiovac angiovac is a system which you can use a cpb and you can use a suction material to suck out this thing you can still do a transvenous but we do not have it we do not know whether any other center has the angiovac device in india and i think uh, ashish do you ashish, need ashish, ashish no no can, can i, I can make a comment hello yeah, sure, can i yeah, make yeah. a comment yeah yeah, yeah. let us i want to have some very basic comment for the students these are very welcome comments but i think they are at a higher level some basic comment with jp already mentioned i see in some centers this root this teaching i don't know from where it has come to remove that inside dressing every uh, every two days and press the wound even when there is no hematoma i was shocked i said who has taught this why should you press on the side of the wound to try to express this wrong teaching should be forgotten at least if today's symposium please forget there is no rule for pressing on both sides of the, the wound and unnecessarily removing the inside dressing you are just exposing to infection um you wanted to yash, say yash can i can i can i answer some of the questions which are there quickly because uh, yeah sure jp go ahead which are there i would probably be able to answer them uh yadav has got this thing about soaking the subclavian area with large gauze ah, soaked with fluorexidin it is not been published in literature the literature on all incisional wounds is that you can just clean it up allow it to dry now do we need discharge antibiotics by and large no they have suggested only one or at the maximum two doses of antibiotics because whatever infection happens is during the time of implant so if you take care of good antibiotic levels at the time of implant and you keep the keep the dressing covered the area covered properly and sterile usually doesn't require when to use laser extraction rather than mechanical see that is another this thing this is from anindya sundar trivedi so laser and this thing these are two mechanic these are two tools which we use if you have lots of calcification laser doesn't work very well so laser is also if if you have a lead which is very flimsy i would prefer laser because then you have less of counter traction on the lead so it all depends sometimes we switch from laser to mechanical mechanical to laser so there is always a switch it is not that we are very very focused on doing it laser i want to prove that i want to take it out with laser no any difference in getting cut inadvertently using tight rail versus right sided no if you are coaxial so the most important thing debrata has asked her, whether there is any difference of lead getting cut inadvertently while using tight rail right versus left sided implant the most important thing when we do a device ex a lead extraction is to keep the whole thing coaxial so the the whole um, you know the lead should be right at the center so you should not have it pushing against the lead so if you have it whether it's from the right or the left side it doesn't matter now there are some uh, for planned procedures yes many times these days with coexisting cad it may not be possible to achieve no we have to have whether you are doing cad whether you are not doing cad whether you are doing congenital absolute hemostasis is a must before you close the wound so please let me tell you uh, about suggestion apurva is about suggestion in conflict with talk by should antiplatelets be stopped on the day of the procedure so as i told you dr shivani if you if you have a patient on two antiplatelets clopidogrel if it's a elective procedure like crt suppose it's an emergency procedure stop as early as possible but if you have an elective procedure like a crt crtd you stop clopidogrel at least about 5 days keep them on very low dose aspirin and then you can do it but i have done it on dual and even triple antiplatelets but for me it is a different question ball game altogether just like anu we have been doing this for a long time hematoma should not be expressed again i am telling you this lead should not be cut yeah. okay these so lead should quite... not be cut hematoma should not be expressed pocket should not be meddled with please do not meddle with the pocket when the patient comes to you for follow up please do not go on pressing it like a ball please stop it anybody is doing it needs to be stopped 
So let's have some brief comments from uh, Dr. Anup and Dr. Anil about preventing CID infection and then back to JP to close the discussion. Anup. Yeah, Ashish, yeah, Ashish, couple of points I wanted to make. Like, you know, when I was starting, yes, said, so it's an art putting a pacemaker or a device in art. And, you know, people pay more attention to putting leads. I don't believe in that. The most important thing, all the residents, they should know how to make a pocket, good pocket, how to good, get a good hemostasis how to make a good leads loop in the pocket. So you will not land up in any infection. See, what I've seen, like, you know, in many of the centers, the surgeon comes to make pocket and he do, does C3. And that is the time I've seen a lot many infection because surgeon will come, he will make the pocket, he will go again. The cardiologist will put a lead and then he will wait for half an hour the surgeon to come back and close the pocket. So that is not acceptable. So, you know, to all, I, I will request all the teachers when you're teaching to perform pacemakers or any devices, Make sure your fellow learns a good surgical technique, how to make a pocket and what JP said. It should not be an anterior axial line. It should be medial. If you are taking an extra thoracic or axillary vein puncture, try to make the pocket more medial. You can make your incision not parallel to the uh, clavicle. You can make a perpendicular incision and you can go medially to that thing. Second thing, what JP was saying, like, you know, when you are doing redo procedures, so many times what happens, the redo procedures when they come, and if the initial implant is not good and the device is so superficial, you don't have any other option rather than to revising the pocket and making the lead free of all adhesion and making a new pocket. So again, the emphasis is that your pocket fascia, just above that. You should not put inside the fat. So, you know, the device comes out and then we are revising. It is very, very difficult. Third thing in this era that very, very important and emphasize there are a lot many schemes and a lot many government schemes are going on and people are getting free devices. So, you know, you need to counsel with the patient and the family before putting the implant, particularly CRTs, because see, they, the hygiene is so poor. And more often we see like, you know, these patients who got free CRTD implantation because of any government scheme, they come with, with an infection. So, you know, you have to make at least two or three counseling with the family, make sure that they will do a good hygiene, Keep them follow up and very good. A lot of question comes like, you know, how, how many days of external pressure. So there's no need to give. If you, if you have a hemostasis, there's no need to give external compression, no sandbag, nothing. Just put a very sterile drape. It could be Primapore or it could be Tegaderm, whatever is your preference. And this should not be because, again, I, I tell you, like, you know, the Dynaplast, the Dynaplast, the white thing of the Dynaplast, that is the culprit of infection in many of the patients. So avoid putting Dynaplast in those kind of patients. One question from my side to JP. So once you diagnose a patient of a granulomatous disease and you're putting a device, so you start steroid upfront or you wait for the wound to heal for first five days and you start steroid. And what you said, like antibiotic, in my practice, I give only single shot of antibiotic, one hour prior to the procedure, no antibiotic afterwards. Forget about antibiotic on discharge. Um, it's a very, very important question. I think it's a very excellent question, Anu. Now, if the patient has got an AV block and it is necessary for you to implant the device because of an AV block, then you would implant the device first, wait for the wound to heal, and then go ahead and sort of start the steroids after the wound has healed satisfactorily. Now, suppose you're going to put this patient because of a ventricular arrhythmia, then you need to be cautious. So you need to start them on steroids get the inflammation down because they are very hot during the early periods. They can throw runs of VTs which can trigger off the device. So steroids and immunosuppression usually cools it down. Then you can reduce the dose of steroids and then implant the device. So it depends on the two scenarios which, which you're going to be faced with. Am I clear? Yes. And uh, any, any suggestion ah, like many patients? connective tissue disorder and who are on chronic steroid for years together. So when they come with complete heart block and you're putting a pacemaker, what is your protocol for the steroid? What you, you try to cut down the dose of the steroid or what you do? We, we, would, we, we would suggest we, we would talk with the rheumatologist and ask them to cut it down to the most minimum possible because obviously many of these patients are, are you know, um, very dependent on steroids for their, you know, disease. So in such a case where there is a high risk of infection, A, I would put it in a subpectral region that my pocket will be subpectral. 
I'll take all care, all sterile care to see that the device is implanted properly. My hemostasis is good. And if necessary, now with the antibiotic envelope being there, I would probably use that. Ah, there, are, there are a couple one, of questions. Can one, one, one very good question, JP, which Ashish asked and you need to address. Like, you know, many a times I've seen, like, you know, people do one supplement puncture and then they make it two and put two the, both the leads together from that single puncture. So, suppose you are doing extraction. How difficult it is, suppose the two leads are put through one puncture, how difficult it is to get your uh, mechanical thing through the leads? There, there, is, there is absolutely no problem whether it's a single puncture or a multiple puncture because they're all so, so very close together. And it doesn't matter as long as we remove the suture right at the, you know, at the uh, entry site. Unless you remove the suture, then your, your, even your, your cutting device will not pass through into the subclavian region. So it is extremely important. If uh, I would have shown you some of uh, the dissection, we do extensive dissection uh, when we take it out because we re remove everything right up to the entry site to have the lead completely free. So that is something which we should do. It doesn't matter whether it's a, uh, whether it's a single puncture, you put three leads in a single puncture, or even if you put single puncture, uh, separate punctures, it doesn't make any difference to lead extraction. Sure. Now there are a few, few questions which, which are important, I think. Can I answer them? Sure, quickly so that I give it to uh... Neil to... Now there is one from, a couple of questions from Dr. Mohammad Sadiq Azam. If there is a wound discharge with a gap very early after no need to wait for anything, it is not an extraction, it's an explant. That means the, during the implant, the whole thing has got infected. So you, there is no need for extraction, it's an explant. So if it is within one year, you just have to pull the lead with a stillet, it will come out, take it out completely. There is no need for a CT. As regards to dressing, so usually if you are hemostasis, if you're worried about hemostasis or if you're worried that this patient is on anticoagulation, you can use a pressure dressing for maybe 24 hours, maybe. Preferably I would not do it because again, I saw that. We have lost JP. Yeah, Anil, can you? Uh... So, yeah, so I think that we have had very good discussion, and I agree that the key to prevent infection is uh, paying adequate attention to detail at the time of implantation. So skin preparation and proper maintenance, sterility, and uh, these things Hello. are very important. I would like Hello. to add one more point: is the closure of the wound. So, uh, what we have seen is that if you if you don't close the deeper layer properly. The wound doesn't heal very well and it can give very easily. So uh, if the deeper layer is closed very tightly, it heals very well. And even if there is some superficial infection, it won't go into the pocket. So closure, while closing the wound, a proper closure of the deep layer is very, very important. If the deep layer gapes, then even if the scar forms, it's very thin. And often sometimes we see a depression at the, at the you know, suture site. So uh, closure of lost the it. is very Do important. Not do not tie the hand to the chest and leave it. It causes the rotator cuff syndrome. So many patients come back with rotator cuff problems because the patient has... Hello? 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 Don't tie the patients up. We are not fractured any, any part of the no, patient. I don't hand. put any. My, so my there, are, very... there, are people who, there, there are people who put their hand, you know, tie it up for like that. It causes rotator cuff so, problems come with chronic rotator cuff yeah, people should start no moving the shoulder right from the beginning. You can, you can ask them to provide it. You've done your suturing. You've done your uh, uh, suturing of the leads very well. You yes. don't need to do this. These are all old things which have come from legacy, which are carried on by people. These are bad techniques. So it should be dropped. So the, the whole idea of my talk is to stop the legacy implant techniques. The, the other thing, JP, I, I tell the hand. there is no need to immobilize the hand yes. whatsoever. So that Please is, do not immobilize yeah, the hand. JP, that is what I convey to the patient and family. Don't listen to the company guy because they will say that don't raise your hand for one month and they come with a bad frozen shoulder. So I, that, I that tell the it. company, I tell the company guys not to instruct anything to the patient except hand over the warranty card and tell me if they interrogate the device, they have to tell me and not tell the patient's relatives. 
So these are two important things that you have to tell because they are nobody. They have not implanted the device. They have no idea how to manage the wound. They have no idea how to do anything. So we have been doing more than 5,000 cases and our implant infection in our lab, it's a government hospital, believe me, is probably less than 0.1%. We usually get an infection when a new fellow comes in. Do not give Dr. Shivani antibiotic protocol. Again, is first dose antibiotic, second dose if necessary. After that, you can stop it. There is no need. Sure. Have I answered most of the question? There are a lot of questions actually. It's quite yes, interesting. Yes, this is a very common topic, JP. You will have a lot of questions because this is sure. a very, very common thing. No, I uh, think it's there's another question. How long to wait for the hematoma to resolve? So please be very patient with the hematoma. It may take three weeks, four weeks to resolve. As long as there are no signs of inflammation, A, there is no fever, B, if it is not very tense and it is not putting a tension on your suture lines where it is likely to burst out or if it is not trying to poke its way out, please don't do anything. Please do not press it. Please do not apply pressure bandage. Just leave it alone. Do not give anticoagulants. Just wait patiently. Most of the time it sort of or, uh, you know, results. JP, last question maybe before we close. What is your follow-up schedule after the implant? Okay. So you discharge, we discharge and what is your follow-up schedule? Also the dis see, what, discharge. Uh, yeah. What we do is we put the Mepilex, we send the patient to the ward, we send them either the next day or the following day. We have made it a rule to send them either the next day or the following day. And then we ask them to come after five days. After five days, we do remove the dressing, check out without handling the pocket. We just gently touch the pocket to see whether it's warm or anything. If it is nothing, we see if the wound has cleanly healed. We just put a dry gauze dressing, tell the patient to take a bath the next day, not apply any powder or any ointment on that. They can wear their clothes, no problem. Come back after a month for, a, for most devices, we recheck it, then come back after three months. And if it's a single chamber device, a single chamber pacemaker, it is once every six months, if it is a more complex device, we ask them to come in. Dual chamber pacemakers, we ask them to come after three months and once every six months. If it's a CRT, CRTD, once every three to four months. I think, thank you very much, uh, JP and your whole team from Jaideva. Uh, we have a bit exceeded our time, but for good reasons, because you do not want to face this uh, dreaded complication of CID infection. Uh, not not more than or even much less than a jp says even less than one in 100 so then it requires that we understand all the care that needs to be taken i think we really had a good discussion both on syncopy which is a very uh, common thing and uh, requires good history taking and a cid infection which requires a good care at the time of implant and that's how we can make things look better i think uh, all the cardiology postgraduates who attended must have benefited for those who could not attend, you all know that the IHRS website hosts these uh, symposia and you can always go there and uh, review what you couldn't attend today. Uh, let me thank the entire faculty for spending a Sunday with us and uh, going out to teach the basics, which sometimes get forgotten or don't get discussed in the routine uh, practice. Thanks once again, everybody. And uh, we will meet uh, in July, uh, the second Sunday, that is 11th, with another experienced set of faculty teaching some very basics which are relevant to the postgraduate. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Take care.